Bible says every Christian is called to service. Your call to salvation included your call to serve. They are the same. So the minute you felt that feeling when God, you realize that God is in your life, you realize that Jesus did something for you, you realize that, you know what, my life is not just about me. You begin to have a new understanding of life. He says that was when you got the calling. Regardless of your job or your career, you are called to full-time Christian service. The Bible says he saved us and called us to be his own people. Not because of what we have done, but because of his own purpose. So he's called us to come and do work for him, to come and contribute to his world, not because we are righteous, not because we are great, not because we are good, but because he chose to make us that. Peter adds, you were chosen to tell about the excellent qualities of God who called you. So that's a big deal. We were chosen to come and talk about the excellent qualities of God who chose us. Anytime you use your God-given abilities to help others, you are fulfilling your calling. Do you get the message now? Whenever you use your abilities and those abilities God gave them to you, so wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your career, whatever your knowledge, your information, your skills, whenever you use it to help others, you are fulfilling your calling. And I remember this so well when I, I got the calling in hair braiding and weaving and extensions. It just came from nowhere. I'd left my telecoms job. I had children and I had no other choice and I thought you know what instead of going to look for another job begging for a job why don't I use my hands and that's what I started doing because then I realized I had kids and if I'm going running to job every day my boss is asking me my kids are ill and I say and I say I want to take them off and he says you can't what will happen let me do my own thing and that's how that calling started and the minute I knew what I was doing, I thought, I'm sure there are other mothers out there who are in similar situation that I was in. So let me share my knowledge with them so they can also grow. Now I was serving God. Now I had responded to the call. So the minute you start sharing with other people, you are responding to your problem. The Bible says, now you belong to him in order that we might be useful in the service of God. How much of the time are you being useful in the service of God? So that's a question we're asking. How much of your time do you share those abilities with other people in order to be serving the world, in order to be fulfilling God's promises? In some churches in China, they welcome new believers by saying, Jesus now has a new pair of eyes. So every time you look at something, that's God seeing through you. Jesus now has new ears to listen with. Jesus now has new hands to help with and a new heart to love other people with. So these churches in China, that's how they welcome new members. The minute they find that you are now giving your life, you're ready to listen to God's calling, they're excited because now God is using you to create all the wonderful things He wants to do. So this is why I feel we really must tap into ourselves, bring out all those abilities, all those gifts God has given us, and start using them. Because the minute we use them, that's God's eyes that seen. That's God's hands that's working. That's God's heart that's loving. That's God's ears that's listening. The Bible says all of us together are Christ's body and each one of us is a separate and necessary part of it. So you know that saying, although we are many, we are one body. All of us belong to one body of God. But we are all separate in our unique ways. He's put different things in each of us. 
our service is desperately needed in the body of Christ, just as any local church. Each of us has a role to play and every role is important. He says, go to any local church and offer your service if you don't know where to start from. Start from the church. Because in the church, like today in church, they were talking about contributing to um, a pot of money that they're using to give to the elderly, people who are, who are unable to come out anymore, people who are unemployed, begging for jobs, people who are desperate for, for money to pay their bills, people who are, who, who are mentally ill. So they have this pot of money that we all have to contribute something to. That's how you contribute. By doing that, you're helping God because you're contributing to life. There is no small service to God. It all matters. And I know, I know one of the shop, um, big shops we have here in the UK says, every little helps. Every little helps. That's cool. Every little helps. Likewise, there is no insignificant ministries in the church. So there is no role in the church that's insignificant. Some are visible and some are behind the scenes, but all are valuable. Small or hidden ministries often make the biggest difference. So behind the scene, in front of the scene, every little bit counts. Every ministry matters because we all are dependent on each other to function. We all need each other to function. What happens when one part of our body fails to function? That's a question he's asking us. Just to illustrate the fact that every role counts. What happens if your hand is ill or you are painting your hand? And I tell you a really good one. You look at the nails, like when I braid hair or I walk with hair, a little cut in the nail and it's a nightmare you cannot braid again. Because every strand of hair fills into that cut. Every strand of hair goes into that cut. So that just goes to show you how every part of our body makes a difference. And that's why he's saying that every part of us, all of us, contribute to life in every form. Not just in the church, but to life generally. We are commanded to serve God. That's God's command to us. Jesus was unmistak unmistakable. Your attitude must be like his own. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be said, but to serve, to give my life. So Jesus came here to give us so much. He said he did, he did not come here for people to serve him, but he came to serve us. I, the Messiah, did not come to be said, so for us to come and be serving him. But he came to serve and give us life. Now, how many of us think in that form? Very rarely. I mean, you wanna go to Nigeria and, and most African cities and you see how when people have money, they just think the end of the world has come. And everybody in the, in the village should come and be worshiping them. For Christian service is not optional. Something to be taken on to our, our schedule if we can spare the time. Or something we need to just add on to our service if we have the time. He says, no, it's not optional. It is the heart of the Christian life. Jesus came to serve and to give. And, and those two vibes should define our life on earth too. To serve and to give. That's what our life should be defined by. We're here to serve and to give to life. So we should remember that all, all the time, to serve and to give. Serving and giving sums up God's fourth purpose for our lives. Mother Teresa once said, holy living consists of in doing God's work with a smile. Holy living consists of doing God's work with a smile. Jesus thought that spiritual maturity is never an end in itself. 
Yeah, so just being more aware, more knowledgeable does not necessarily mean that's the end of your life. Maturity is for ministry. We grow up in order to give out. That's the whole knowledge. That's the reason for the knowledge. In order that we should learn what the purpose is for us to do. It is not enough to keep learning more and more. So once you've learned something, you need to bring it to life. You need to activate it. Not just go and be learning and learning and learning. Like most of us do. We're constantly reading the Bible. Every day we're reading the Bible. There's so many people who will tell you they've finished reading the Bible. But do they practice what the Bible says? That's where the question is. Are we living these things that we've learned? We must act on what we know and practice what we claim to believe. Impression without expression causes depression. I absolutely love this comment. It says, impression without expression causes depression. So, something comes into your life. You don't express it. You don't take it out. Something has come in. So, this is knowledge coming in. And I, I can also relate to this with braiding as well. So we learn how to braid. We have that skill. We go home, we do nothing with it. That's what he said. So impression, you've taken in knowledge. Expression is when you use the knowledge. Use it for good use. And there's something, I know there's a saying, um, what you don't use, you lose. So impression, something has come into your life. You express it, you share it. But now if something came in and you don't share it, what that means is you have depressed it. You have pressed it down in yourself. And so that's such a good statement. Impression without expression leads to depression. And that's what's happening to most of us. Such an important statement, take in, exhale. So when you take in air, you exhale it. That's expression. When you force it inwards, then that's like leading to depressing it. Study without service leads to spiritual stagnation. That's another way he puts it. So you're constantly reading and reading and reading the Bible and you don't use it, you don't take it to share with others in the sense of sharing the knowledge you've learned, it leads to spiritual stagnation. The old comparison between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is still true today. I didn't even know this until I read this book and it was such a good knowledge. It said Galilee is a lake full of life because it takes in water but also gives it out. So this sea, water comes in and water goes out. That's Galilee, River Galilee. But then in contrast, nothing lives in the Dead Sea because water comes in, water doesn't go out. I didn't know that's why it was called the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in it. With no air flow, the lake has stagnated. So because there's nothing going out, it is stagnation. Same thing with us human beings. We take in knowledge, we don't use it, we stagnate. That's how simple life is. Because the more you use the knowledge you have, the more knowledge you get. So in contrast, nothing lives in the Dead Sea because with no air flow, the lake has stagnated. So this explains most of our lives. We take in things, but we don't give out. We are then stuck in a rut. You will find that those who give out grow and those who don't remain stagnated. They remain stunted. And it made me think, I know so many people who don't stop going to university. They finish one course, they take another. They finish that one, then they take another. And 
if they find they've gone to the end of the road on that course, they divert into another course. And they're not prepared to go take on any job that makes them express what they have learned in the one course. So they impress and impress and impress. So much coming in and nothing going out. What does it lead to? Depression. It is depressed. Because with education, you just can't keep throwing things in without practicalizing it, without bringing it to life. And this is one of the biggest reasons why I am so desperate to take my knowledge to places where it will be appreciated. Because right now, I have taken on so much in the form of skills, knowledge, information, and what am I doing with them? So this chapter has opened a lot of knowledge to me as well. Impression without expression leads to start, um, depression. So we need to learn to start to using what we know. Share it, bring it to life. Because the more you use it, the bigger you grow. The more knowledge comes to your life. You know when we started the chapter, we were talking about nature and how we contribute to life. And you remember how lots of us just want to complain that nothing, nothing is coming our way. God is not giving us anything. But we forget that because we have not brought anything out, nothing will come back in. If we just keep taking things in and we don't bring anything out, no new thing comes out. And I told a story in the other chapter, the last chapter, where we just take, for instance, a bag and you keep putting things into it and putting things into it and putting things into it. The bag gets full. If you want to put any new thing into it, you have to bring out some of the content in that bag for new things to come in. I know a friend who, after every year, she throws away most of her clothes. And she says to me, if I don't do that, I can't buy new things. That's the same thing we're talking about here. If you keep taking in so much and you never give out, no new thing will come into your life. So this is a big message for all of us. If we want nature to give us something, we need to give nature something. The last thing many believers need today is to go to another Bible study. They already know far more than they are putting into practice. So it just goes to talk about when we read the Bible over and over and over and we don't put it into action. What they need are seven experiences in which they can exercise their spiritual muscle. So if you are in a service in a church, like I was saying about this group, this pot of money you put in, in so much money, it's not enough to just put the money as well. You could actually go out there to help the old people. You could contribute in the community. This applies to most of us. If we have taken on so much training, information, skills, experiences, we need to let it out or we end up being depressed. We cannot add more to where there already is a lot. We need to release them in order to get more. Serving is the opposite of our natural inclination. This is what he's telling us. He says most of the time we're more interested in people serving us than we serving people. So naturally we just want people to serve us. We don't feel we should serve anyone. We say I'm looking for a church that meets my needs and blesses me. If it's not the other way, I'm looking for a place to serve and be a blessing to the church. We expect others to serve us, not vice versa. This is so true of the attitude of us Africans. I'm giving that example. No one is interested in being a blessing to the people. Rather, they are looking for people that will worship them. But as we mature in Christ, the focus of our lives should increasingly shift to living a life of service. That's what the focus of our life should be. As we begin to spiritually mature, the focus should be, let me serve, not to be served. 
the, the mature follower of Jesus stops asking, who is going to meet my needs? And starts asking, whose needs can I meet? So that's a big question for us now. And the same applies to business as well. When you start thinking I want to set up a business, don't worry too much about how much money am I going to make out of this business. That's all we ever do. Is this business going to grow? But we forget that the people that buy from us are human beings and they have needs. So if we say to ourselves, whose needs can we meet as a business? We'll find that the business will grow naturally without us stressing ourselves. Because we are meeting needs. And it's those needs that bring the money in. Not the other way around. Not where can I make money. It's rather whose needs can I meet? Do we ever ask that question? Time to be honest with ourselves. Do you meet other people's needs rather than just your own? So that's the question he's asking us in this chapter. So the next bit says preparing for eternity. At the end of our life on earth, we will each stand before God and He is going to evaluate how well we served others in our life. Bible says each of us will have to give a personal account to God. Think about the implication of this. One day God will compare how much energy and time we spent on ourselves compared with what we invested in serving others. He's going to compare it. He will look at us and ask us. All the information he gave us, all the knowledge he gave us, all the talent he gave us, how much of it did we use in serving others? Rather than just serving ourselves. At that point, all our excuses for self-centeredness will sound hollow. We sound rubbish. I was too busy. That's the answer will be given God. I had my own goals. I was preoccupied with working. I was having so much fun. Oh, I was preparing for retirement. To call the excuses, God will respond. Sorry, wrong answer. So when we start giving God all these excuses, he will still tell us, sorry, wrong answer. I created, I saved you, and I called you, and I commanded you to live a life of service. What part did you not understand? So that would be the question to us. We've been called to a life of service. Our life has been saved so we can serve others. But now we're busy focusing on just ourselves. The Bible wants unbelievers. He will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves. So if all we ever think of is just ourselves, we will get the answer. But for Christians, it will mean a loss of eternal rewards. We are only fully alive when we are helping others, Jesus said. If you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. And this is, this is one passage in the Bible that I really love. It says those who, who work so hard to save their own life, they end up losing it. Because all the attention for you is all about yourself. You just want to focus on you and you alone. You end up losing it. If you insist on saving your life, you lose it. Only those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to live. So those who lose their life for God will actually be the ones who are saved. Those who contribute to God will actually be the ones who actually enjoy and have fun with God. If you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. Only those who lose their lives for me, for my sake, and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to really live. Jesus said that. This truth is so important that it is repeated five times in the Bible. If you aren't serving, you're just existing. That's what he's reminding us. If you're not serving your community, if you're not contributing for, to life, if you're not supporting other people, you're just existing. 
and life is more important than just existing you need to wake up and start doing something with your life if you aren't serving you are just existing because life is meant for ministry for sharing for giving for contributing God wants us to learn to love and serve others unselfishly. That's the big message. He wants us to learn to love and serve others unselfishly. Service and significance. We are going to give our life for something. And that's what he's telling us. This is, this is a fact. All of us will give our life to something big question now is what will it be what will you give your life for? take this very seriously now because when i read this i was like oh my goodness it never really did touch me this one we are going to give our life for something what will it be will it be your career will it be a sports will it be a hobby will it be a job Will it be fame? Because some people, they become so famous. That's their life. Will it be wealth? Will it be chasing wealth for the rest of your life? Will it be for your family? You live just for your family. Will it be for alcohol? Again, there are people, that's all they want to do. Just drink alcohol. Will it be for drugs? People who are constantly injecting themselves or taking all kinds of drugs. Will it be for just chasing women? There are people who, they call them womanizers. All their life, they're not thinking any other thoughts, just women. Will it be for education? Just going to school, constantly. That's the big question. What do you want to give your life for? Something takes our lives. Something we give our daily existence for. Something that we, we just derive pleasure doing it. None of this will have a lasting significance in your life. That's what he's telling us. So all these things we've mentioned, the things that we generally think about that we want to give our life for, it will not have a significant, a lasting significance in our life. Service is the pathway to real significance. Contribution, giving something, ministering something to life, bringing something into life. It is through ministry that we discover the meaning of our lives when we bring something to life. The Bible says each of us finds our meaning and function as part of his body. As we serve together in God's family, our lives take on eternal importance. Paul said, I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less, because of what you are part of. God wants to use us to make a difference in his world. He wants to walk through us. So that's a big message for us. God wants to use our eyes. God wants to use our hands, our ears, our legs, our voices. He wants to walk through us. And that's why we're here. What matters is not the duration of our life, but the donation of our life. You get that? It's not how long we live. Because that's what most of us worry about. Especially us Nigerians again that go there. Everybody is scared of the next person because that person wants to kill them. Your neighbor is bad. That person is wicked. That person is a witch. They want to kill you. And I always ask myself, what are you doing here if you want to just live here forever? But you're not adding any value to life. What is the point of your being here if you're not adding any value to life? Because truth is, we don't know what the next place is like. I mean, those of us here, we haven't died before. Because when we die, we move on. But we don't know where we're going. We don't know if it might be better than here. But no, all of us are desperate to remain here. And yet we don't want to add anything to life. You see, not how long we live, but how we live. Not how long we live, but how we live. And when 
you look at most really, really great people, they didn't live too long. Jesus was only 33. And look at the amazing difference he made to life. He didn't live 104 or 90 or 80. If we're not involved in any service or ministry, what excuse have we been using? What have we been telling ourselves that that's why we're here? Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was cold dependent. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair and all kinds of family problems. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was reluctant. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least. Peter was impulsive and hot tempered. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had poor health, poor health. Timothy was timid. This is just a variety of misfits where God used all of them in his service. Did you hear all these people that I mentioned? They are all names from the Bible and they had various things that they were struggling with. Moses thought that he couldn't speak, but yet Moses was the one Jesus uh, God sent to go and speak to Pharaoh on behalf of the Israelites. And you see some of them were timid. I'll take those names again just to get this message really clear. He says, if we're not involved in any service or ministry, what excuse have we been using? And then he gives us examples. He said, Abraham was old when God called him. Jacob was insecure, but God called him. Leah was unattractive, God called him. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was codependent. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair and all kinds of family problems. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was reluctant. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric, to say the least. Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had poor health. Timothy was timid. And all of these people are a variety of misfits, but God used all of them in his service. He will use us too if we stop making excuses. That's what he's saying. So whatever your situation, look at that long list and many more people in the Bible. God used all of them. Nobody is saying, because I am like this and I'm like that. I mean, there are some of them who are even lepers. Like that lady who was uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, He was, she was resurrected and she immediately stood up and started serving God. So any of us, are, we are all in a position to serve God for great things. We are here to do great things on this earth and contribute. We shouldn't hide under any more excuses. That's the big message here. So that's the end of this chapter and I'll quickly finish off with our questions and our meditation. So you notice that we've changed different locations, Some of, like now the sun is straight in my face, um, we've been in shades and we've been all over the place but all of this was just for you to see how amazing working with nature can be. So a point for us to remember. Service is not optional. Service is a necessity. Meditation. For we are God's workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. So the question is, what is holding me back from accepting God's call to serve him? What is holding you back from accepting God's call, from contributing to life, from being there for other people, from bringing out the best that's in you? 
from bringing out all those skills, all those unique things that God has created you for. What is holding you back? So that's the end of this chapter today. And I'm so glad um, we've been able to do this to make this day stand out in your, in your view. We look forward to seeing you in the next chapter, maybe back to our usual area, but again, we'll take it as it comes. So thank you so much for watching and God bless you abundantly.